Welcome to the History News Network podcast edition. I'm David Austin Walsh, editor of the History News Network, and with me today to discuss Steven Spielberg's new movie, Lincoln, is Louis P. Major, William R. Kennan Jr. Professor in American Institutions and Values at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, where Professor Major teaches American cultural history and the history of the Civil War era. He's won a number of different awards over the course of his professional career, teaching awards from Harvard University and the City College of New York, fellowships from the Whiting Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Mellon Foundation, and is the author of numerous books on the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln, most recently Lincoln's Hundred Days, The Emancipation Proclamation, and The War for the Union, out now by Harvard University Press. Professor Major is also the author of a recent article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, entitled Lincoln at the Movies, which is a cultural history of our 16th president. President's film appearances. In it, he highly praised Spielberg's new movie, Daniel Day-Lewis's performance as the president, writing that the actor summons Lincoln from the dead, and the contemporary political relevance of the film. Professor Major is joining me by phone. Professor, thank you for agreeing to, uh, to speak with HNN today. First of all, Professor Major, uh, here's the question that's on everybody's mind. Uh, how accurate is the movie Lincoln? Uh, it's, it, it, it's a great question, and of course, as with all these things, it depends on, on what we want from accuracy. The, the overarching tale, the tale that Lincoln involved himself in uh, wrangling votes and applying pressure to get the 13th Amendment passed through the House is absolutely true, uh, as are some of the subplots in the film, uh, his relationship with Mary Tom Lincoln and family concerns. Uh, the Hampton Roads Conference was indeed going on at the time. So in that sense, the film is, uh, is very accurate to, to, to what was taking place. Uh, we can talk further at some point about some of the larger kind of interpretive issues. Uh, and then the more specific inaccuracies are, are sort of minor, but, but those are there as well, despite the fact that Spielberg devoted a tremendous amount of attention to trying to get things as historically accurate as possible. Uh, and can you point out some of these uh, inaccuracies? I know Harold Holzer uh, wrote a very lengthy article in uh, the Daily Beast recently just uh, doing just that, but uh, uh-huh. what, what, uh, what jumped out at you? Well, you know, there are they're, they're just um, some, some matters of sort of tone and, and, and detail. Uh, you know, there's a scene where Lincoln slaps his son in the face. Uh, it's highly unlikely given what we know about Lincoln, that he ever would have um, used kind of, you know, physical punishment upon his children. Uh, there's an incident much earlier in his life where uh, he sort of said he, he had spanked one of his sons and said he had regretted doing it. So that, that's just a moment that doesn't ring true. Um, there, there, there are other details that, um, you know, for example, the, the, the posture of, of Lincoln's body uh, on the bed in the scene that depicts after the assassination is not accurate based on the uh, historical record as we know it. Uh, things like Grant's dress when he comes out of the meeting uh, at Appomattox Courthouse is not accurate. So those, but, but, those are the kinds of, uh, of, of details that, um, that may be troubling to some. I have to admit, uh, when, I, when I watched the Appomattox scene, I was struck by the fact that Grant was wearing his full dress uniform and was not spattered in mud. <laughs> Tony Kushner wrote a brilliant script that uh, takes 
literary and poetic license where it needs to in order to sort of make a larger point about the war and emancipation. So what you're saying seems to be that um, it's more important that the texture of the film uh, is, is, is in a broad sense accurate. And uh... Yes, for me it is. Uh, you know, I think it's, it's an incredible, riveting performance. I mean, everyone has said this. Uh, there, there's not much more to be said about Daniel Bay Lewis's uh, evocation of Lincoln. Uh, the voice, the, the, the posture, the walk, uh, it, it really is just remarkable. Well, I you think know, anyone who's read Lincoln and studied Lincoln for a long period of time sort of feels they're in Lincoln's presence watching Day Lewis act. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true, but I, I, I do need to point out that um, there was an article, it was actually published sl slightly before the wide release of the film, but it was in the, uh, uh, the Daily Telegraph, which, which is a British newspaper, and it was all about how audiences did not find uh, Daniel Day Lewis believable as Lincoln because he was not deep voiced because he was ungainly because he did not conform to the myths and and we'll we'll talk about this later with the sort of cinematic history of how Lincoln's been portrayed but how the myth of Abraham Lincoln and how he's been portrayed in the past. But that's exactly the point. Uh, so coming back to the point of historical accuracy, uh, what what is so marvelous about the portrayal is it does capture what we know of Lincoln. Um, from a, from a historically accurate viewpoint. Yes, everyone wants to imagine Lincoln with the deep stentorian voice of a, of a, uh, of a Henry Fonda or, or a Hal Holbrook. Uh, the fact of the matter is, contemporaries all said he had a sort of high-pitched, squeaky voice, almost a tenor, and uh, Day-Lewis mirrors that. So uh, in that sense, I think the film does great service in terms of challenging uh, a certain iconic sense of Lincoln uh, and, and making him a human being, uh, allowing us to see him uh, in his kind of storytelling, awkward, uh, awkward best. Mm -hmm. Is there something slightly uncanny about uh, having an Anglo-Irishman like Daniel Day-Lewis portraying and, and uh, you know, to a certain extent deconstructing the myths we've built up around such a quintessential American icon? Well, it's an amazing thing about Daniel Day-Lewis, because if you look at the roles that he's played, I mean, one can narrate a large chunk of American history just from the sort of historical roles, uh, both fictional and real, that he's played, whether going back to Last of the Mohicans or Bill the Butcher uh, in, in the Martin Scorsese film, The Gangs of New York, or um, other roles that he played in There Will Be Blood. So he, he, it's fascinating to think about uh, how it is that he's drawn to these deeply historical roles and his ability to immerse himself and, and really uh, bring out something about the period that seems uh, really true and authentic to us. Hmm. Well, stepping away from Lincoln, the, the modern film, and, and uh, going back towards your uh, to your uh, article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, you wrote, uh, which, which sort of served as a, a cinematic history of how Lincoln has been portrayed, and there was a question I wanted to ask you, because you briefly touched on it in the article, but uh, you didn't go into an incredible amount of detail. Um, Lincoln's first appearance on the silver screen was in D.W. Griffin's uh, racist epic, Birth of a Nation. And how was this Lincoln portrayed uh, compared to later on? Yeah, I want to be clear that that's not the, the absolute first depiction of Lincoln. There are some even earlier shorts and silent films uh, in which uh, Lincoln is depicted, but that is the first one that I think is of, of major significance, certainly, if we're going to talk about the kind of arc of portrayals of Lincoln. And and what we have in certainly those those early uh, depictions, and again, this is D.W. Griffith, and The Birth of a Nation is, is one of these classic movies that serves to uh, offer an interpretation of Reconstruction that, that reigned for a long time. But Lincoln appears in part one, and he is not in any way the great emancipator, but he's the great reconciler. And this is part of a very common argument that was popular in the first part of the uh, of the 20th century, the idea that you know the great tragedies of Lincoln's assassination is that he had real affection for the South, and that had he lived, the process of Reconstruction uh, would have gone far more smoothly. Uh, D.W. Griffith uh, picks that up again in a full-length biopic of Lincoln that he did in 1930. It's a talking picture, uh, and that, again, is the sort of theme to the extent that we deal with the Civil War. There's almost no mention whatsoever about slavery or Lincoln's role as, as an emancipator. And that seems to be fairly common 
in film portrayals. Uh, you know, what, what Spielberg's Lincoln does is in many ways overturn uh, over a century of depictions of Lincoln that for one reason or another sort of shied away from the question of emancipation and slavery. Uh, it may be, and this comes back to a point of interpretation, that it almost goes too far, right? That it gives us Spielberg's Lincoln, gives us Lincoln as full-fledged, raging abolitionist in 1865, which he may well have been by then, but what Spielberg's film doesn't allow us to see is Lincoln's growth and evolution and transformation over time that gets him to that point. Well, it should be noted that that was, uh, I believe, a deliberate decision on Spielberg's part. There's the, the story is circulating that Tony Kushner, when he turned in his uh, first draft, uh, covered Lincoln's entire life, or at least his entire political life, or uh, perhaps, and I might be getting my effects from perhaps it was just the presidency, but it was a, it was a long, drawn-out epic of a film, and Spielberg said to him, well, the, the, strongest, treat, the strongest part of this treatment is um, the last three months of his life, so let's just make a movie about that. Which is fine, and we still end up with a very long film at two and a half hours, but my point is uh, it, it almost goes too far. If we're talking about the sort of interpretation that the film offers, it, it presents Lincoln as being far more uh, abolitionist than in many ways that he was prior to that. Uh, you know, there's, there's an awkward scene in the movie where Daniel Day-Lewis has to explain why a 13th Amendment is needed because the Emancipation Proclamation didn't abolish slavery. Uh, I just think that you know, there might have been uh, a sort of truer sense of Lincoln's evolution, which in and of itself is a very dramatic story that could have been incorporated uh, into the movie. But it's fine that it's not there. It just can leave viewers with a mistaken impression about Lincoln's own dramatic set of transformations on the path from uh, being anti-slavery, but then taking the action of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and then moving forward toward the 13th Amendment. Uh, time permitting, we may come back to the uh, to, to Lincoln's own arc here, but I wanted to talk briefly about uh, Eric Foner's uh, letter to the editor to the uh, New York Times of, I believe, last week. Um, he called the film's view of history, quote, severely truncated, uh, going on to write that the 13th Amendment actually originated with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, whom are not mentioned in uh, Spielberg's movie. And in fact, I uh, recently had somebody contact me on Twitter promoting their own film treatment for the true story of the origins of the 13th Amendment. In, in any event, um, he, uh, Foner also wrote that uh, the slaves were freeing themselves uh, in the wake of Confederate military defeats by the winter of 1865, and none of this is mentioned in the movie. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, look, Foner's basic point is, is, is a terrific point, that it's about nuance in history. So, uh, again, it, it's related to the point that I've been making, that you can't just begin the story uh, of emancipation and abolition with these few months in 1865, because, as I said, it foreshortens and it curtails some of the complexity in the arc of that narrative. In the same way... Um, the film overdoes the relationship between the uh, debate over the 13th Amendment in the House and the Hampton Roads Peace Conference uh, to make it suggest that there was a sort of choice here being made between peace and abolition. Uh, that's a false choice, and, and it seems clear that by January of 1865, uh, there is not going to be peace without abolition. So, But for dramatic purposes, the film sort of elevates the Hampton Roads Conference to, to a place that it didn't really hold uh, at the moment. Uh, the other arguments about who freed the slaves gets us into an, another set of, of discussions and, and issues, which I'd be happy to go into, as you know, because I've just written about the Emancipation Proclamation, and we're um, on the verge of celebrating the sesquicentennial of the signing of that decree. Uh, what about Kate Masseur's article in the New York Times from, from November 13th, where she criticized the film for having no fully fleshed African-American characters. Well, uh, I think it's a real disappointment about the film, uh, that there's, there's a missed opportunity there, and it wouldn't have been that difficult to take someone such as Frederick Douglass <clears throat> and to write him in as a character, you know, Douglass, who throughout the war uh, pushed Lincoln and agitated for abolition and... Uh, who Lincoln, at the time of his second inaugural, uh, treated treated very well and, in fact, met with him. So I think uh, to have had some uh, African-American characters who are, are more than just window dressing, uh, as in Elizabeth Keckley, uh, would have added significantly uh, to the film. 
and please do go on about the Emancipation Proclamation because part of the reason this conversation is so important is because inevitably this movie will be used in the classroom. It, I mean, it, it really is inevitable. Uh, and I think it's, uh, personally, I think it, it will be very valuable in the classroom, but at the same time there needs to be historians around to provide the proper context uh, about what the film doesn't go into. So um, uh, please, uh, uh, if you can give us the, I, I'm putting you on the spot here, but the, the sort of five minute version. Of... Well, well, let me just put it this way. I mean, there to to just focus on the Thirteenth Amendment without focusing on the, the the long history that gets to that point is to miss, in some ways, the most dramatic and significant elements of the story. Lincoln himself understood that the Thirteenth Amendment was necessary in part because of the limitations of the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, the Emancipation Proclamation did indeed free slaves. Uh, this is a whole other shift in historiography where Lincoln went from being the great emancipator to falling into somewhat obscurity for a variety of different reasons, particularly uh, in the post-Civil Rights era as people began to look at different elements of the Civil War. In some ways, I think we've lost the significance and the momentousness of the, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, and now is a good time to try and recover that. Uh, unfortunately, the film doesn't allow us to do that, but Lincoln issues that decree, and the decree that he issues on January 1st is a very different one than the one that three months earlier he said he was going to uh, issue. It's, it's more radical, it's more extreme, uh, he abandons colonization, he authorizes the enlistment of black troops, so those black troops we see at the beginning of Spielberg's Lincoln are there because the Emancipation Proclamation authorized their enlistment, and ultimately the story uh, and, and the film Glory, of course, is, is, is a great Civil War movie that tells part of that story of those 179,000 African-American troops is critical not only to winning the war, but also to arguments for citizenship rights after the war. So the Emancipation Proclamation is, is a signal achievement. I mean, Frederick Douglass at the time proclaims... Uh, you know, July 4th was great, January 1st is greater, and, and it is seen in the light of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, without understanding that story, and then the story that goes from 1863 to 1865, uh, particularly as Lincoln began to fear what would happen if he loses the election of 1864, and that's a very real possibility. Uh, will the Emancipation Proclamation hold up? Will it be retracted? Will it be found unconstitutional? So there's a, a long... Uh, important story here about, yes, you know, Lincoln freed many slaves, but freeing slaves is not the same as abolishing slavery. Uh, and at the same time, there's the ongoing problem of the existence of slavery in those four border states, uh, Delaware, Maryland, Missouri, and Kentucky. Uh, so there's a longer story here, and it's a story uh, from looking at it from Lincoln uh, of, of his own evolution, his own growth, his own radicalization with respect to his uh, understanding of how to go about abolishing slavery and the significance of doing so. Well, and I, I, I think that part of that is actually in a very oblique way referenced in the movie when there's this scene, and it's, it's been written about very favorably, and I enjoyed it, where he gives a legalistic argument, uh, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis as Lincoln, gives a legalistic argument against the Emancipation Proclamation to explain why it's necessary to move ahead with the 13th Amendment. Yeah, but as I sort of alluded, I, I, I agree, but I think uh, historians get that. Uh, I'm not sure to what extent you know the, the, the everyday viewer understands uh, how the, the argument, the way it's presented in the film. But yeah, there is some attempt, because there has to be an attempt to sort of explain that, uh, explain why a constitutional amendment went further than the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, but this is not to say that the Emancipation Proclamation itself uh, did not matter, did not free the slaves, was not one of the most radical acts uh, in many ways in, in, in the history of, of um, U.S. government and politics. This has been a production of the History News Network. We'll gather from the plain.